Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reuse Company webinars. My name is Cecilia, and uh, I will be hosting today's webinar. With me online, I have Bob Sherman from Procter & Gamble, and he will talk about how to tailor our systems engineering suite to the model-based systems engineering particular use case of his company. You will be muted during the webinar, but if you have any questions or comments, you can use the chat box. But please add your comments to the reuse company and not to the presenter. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box or send an email to support at reusecompany.com. The webinar will be recorded, and in a few days, we will send you the link to the recording. Uh, first, we will have a short presentation of the reuse company. And then we will listen to Bob Sherman, and after that we will have some time for questions. Okay, let's start with a few words about the Reuse Company. We are a worldwide company. We have partners in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Japan, and customers in the US, Europe, and Asia. Our headquarters is in Madrid, but we also have offices in Stockholm and in London. Here you can also see some companies that are users of our system. They are from the aerospace industry, defense, automotive, railway, and energy, among others. We provide tools and solutions for knowledge, traceability, reuse, and quality management. We do that by using semantic analysis technologies, and these technologies have been used in a wide range of industries. We haven't yet found any industry that couldn't make use of our tools. Our focus is on reuse, traceability, and quality, and we integrate the tools and technology we have with the way that you do your work. We provide the data that allow you to present your quality analysis, and we allow you to develop your knowledge basis so that you can most accurately assess the quality of your specifications. Our mission is to reuse knowledge within any organization, Knowledge is probably the most valuable asset of any company, and we can offer processes, methods, tools, and services. Our technologies are innovative, artificial intelligence-based, and we are having a lot of success helping people improve the quality of their documentation. Now let me introduce you to the presenter. Uh, Bob Sherman is a chemical engineer from the University of South Florida. He has 15 years of experience of process or machine design and controls engineering. And then he has been working for 20 years as an enterprise ar architect in areas of product lifecycle management, manufacturing process design, and factory floor operations. Now he's an enterprise ar architect for systems engineering at Procter & Gamble. So let's start with uh, the webinar called Burn the Boats, Truly Integrating Requirements and Systems Models. All right, let's get started. Uh, so I'll start off with, I think, uh, painting some common ground uh, between Procter & Gamble and your companies, because you might be a little bit surprised that a consumer packaged goods company might have some type of experience that would be common across our industries. And in fact, we acknowledge that uh, on the surface, we appear to be very different. And so here, if you look at the typical aerospace, Navy type of thing, you can sell a ship for a billion dollars, but on the other hand, we need to sell two billion diapers uh, to make the same amount of money. Uh, but there, in a, I think beyond these differences, uh, most notably the life cycles, our life cycles are very, very fast on all of our products which impacts the product all the way through the manufacturing process and global distribution uh, types of challenges. But uh, I think in addition to those differences, there's many similarities in that I think in the end, if you think about what the stakeholders want from systems, they end up being pretty simple things. And right, and in fact, that's our job as people that build systems is to insulate them from that. And so for uh, an airliner, it might be to transport a payload. For us, it might be to absorb a spill or soften somebody's hair, that kind of thing. But in fact, the machines, the mechanisms by which we deliver that, the issue is it's a different invisibility. So if you tear a paper towel off of a roll, 
you don't see the paper machine, but obviously you do see it if you're flying on a plane. Uh, but a lot of people would never guess that we have the same number of parts on a paper machine as you'd find on a 747. Uh, same number of lines of code on a diaper machine as in the Joint Strike Fighter. There's all kinds of benchmarking stats we've come up with to just sort of reaffirm that, in fact, we have systems problems, too, to solve. Uh, Multi-physics problems uh, with fluids, mechanics, aerodynamics, you name it, uh, fabrics. And they're information intensive. Uh, then we manufacture in 75 countries around the world. So we have to maintain a workforce and a development capability and distribution channel that spans the world. So we share a lot of the same problems because I recognize that in a lot of your businesses, the folks that are on the call. We, we also have some other commonalities in terms of our goal, that we have ruthless uh, stakeholders uh, who have high expectations in terms of sales growth, margin, capital efficacy, and you know it's our jobs uh, to manipulate these systems of innovation, uh, multidiscipline systems of innovation, to produce those results for the shareholder. I th and there's a limited amount of levers we can pull. Most of them are in the work process because it's hard to just sort of demand new ideas. So we have to set up, set the stage for new ideas. And in benchmarking with a lot of uh, companies, as P&G undertook our program to set up a systems engineering. Uh, work practice, we found that it's a very common phenomena that that enterprises are very common on the thing that caused for an, innov an innovation to happen. So the idea or the stakeholder requirements that must be met uh, and very good at capturing the as-built. So the things after the products in market, those things are detailed and preserved. But what we find is that we are constantly losing the decision knowledge that went into those development efforts. So the rationalization of design. We think the reason why that is, is that any initiative is really kind of an organic process. And that in the current state, an idea is surfaced and then multiple disciplines get together from product development all the way through to distribution centers. And they talk about the implications of that. And that's on this diagram on the left, it's the top of the diagram. And as they discuss and have meetings, they produce artifacts and they understand more clearly what the implications are and the process plays out. And so you really don't sort of see the whole impact of the initiative until you're done with it at that point. And that affects the way these artifacts are organized and the communications, there's inefficiencies there that slow the speed of innovation. And most notable, right, germane to this conversation today is requirements suffer from that. And it's the typical things. People are not aware of the visibility of the trade-offs. Requirements are overlooked or incorrect or overly constrained. And then lastly, premature convergence on solution. So we think that really the root cause for this is the absence of context. The requirements are typically written in requirements documents, which is nice for the author of that, but people seldom pick up a one or 200 page requirements document and consume the whole thing. You open the document, you have something in mind, it's the requirements for a particular element of the system in a particular case. And so what we think is, is that as this example serves here, if we can place requirements in a systems model, similar to juxtaposing these letters here, but not necessarily perfectly juxtaposing all the letters, we will spot trade-offs and requirements, excessive or incorrect requirements, overly constrained. We'll, we'll be able to make mistakes, but they won't have the same impact if we can place those requirements in the systems model. So that's the hypothesis here. And in fact, we think we have to do that because if you think about the multiple dimensions of a requirement, their time, location, activity, dependencies on other elements of the system, and their individual identity. Uh, this context is really key. And so, so the challenge really is this, that 
when an initiative begins, and so I'm kind of showing the simplified version of ISO 15288 on the right-hand side of the display here, and there are multiple Vs going back into the page, essentially one V for each discipline. It could be uh, product development, manufacturing, operations, sales, you name it. But as these initiatives gather together at the beginning of an initiative to establish what are the needs of those stakeholders of those different domains, and the initiative progresses, each of those disciplines discovers more about what they have to do to make the initiative a success. And they also discover interdependencies between the disciplines. And if all works correctly, that flows back uphill because there's trade-off decisions in there for the higher level processes to guide. This type of recursion, explication of needs and solutions goes down the left-hand side of the V until you ultimately get to something that you have to fabricate. You have an interface with the outside world. You're going to procure a part or a service or a machine. And so the really tying this back to the problem that we have here is that really today the best practices or I'll say the most often used practices of requirements involve documents. And this is where we get into the, the burn the boat scenario. Where it, we, we can't imagine taking a half step here. We really think that in order to get the requirements into the context of the system model and keep them up to date, that we have to do away with the requirements documents. In fact, maybe to just automatically produce those as views from the systems model. So that's the key thing. If we can't do that, we'll never be able to do the impact analysis across the requirements documents and certainly down to the highly structured systems like PLM systems where we interface with the outside world. So that's the key. So we went in search of a solution for this. And we suspected that a very simple canonical model was going to be required to fit requirements together with the other elements of a system. And when I say simple, uh, something more simple than uh, SysML at 100 plus concepts. Uh, to be able to deploy something across all the disciplines, we felt like we needed something on the order of a dozen concepts at most. And so we came across an individual by the name of Bill Schindel of ICTT, uh, a spinoff of the Rose Holman School of Systems Engineering that had created a method, uh, a meta model called Systematica. And I'm just going to briefly review that. There's a couple obvious concepts in here that I think everybody would, would acknowledge is that systems are always built with stakeholders in mind, and there's measures of goodness of the, the system, which we'll, we'll call features. The part that became a little more insightful and it provided the context for the requirements was the notion of no feature really is delivered until there's been some interaction between the elements of a system, uh, those interactions being to change each other's state. And herein lies the context of a requirement, is that the requirement specifies the behavior of an element of the system in an interaction to deliver a feature to satisfy a stakeholder. As we think about traversing down the left-hand side of that V, you could do functional analysis. Each one of these functional roles could be further decomposed in the systems. Then ultimately, you get to the point where you're not going to analyze the thing you're going to purchase it. If you're building a personal computer, you're going to purchase that hard drive, you're not going to design it. So the same thing happens really as we talk about these types of methods. We're trying to decompose function until we get to the point where we can purchase it. And so what we really have here is the need of a simple fractal model where requirements can be in context as we take each one of those roles in a system and realize in fact that it is a system. So here I show an element of a system, an interacting system, gets decomposed into other interactions between sub-elements. And the requirements need to live inside of those decomposed systems. And really, all I'm doing is kind of conveying to you in a different way, a visual way, with a systems fractal model, the derivation of requirements. And so, of course, to, to derive new requirements, you have to derive new system elements. So I think that probably flows. And those requirements, if you think about the lowest level derived requirements, really the contract is, is that if you deliver those requirements, then you should have met the upper level, more abstract requirement. And if you cannot 
have that confidence, then that means essentially there's been an error in the decomposition of the system elements or a missing interaction between the roles. But in essence, I think we all do this every day. This is just representing a fractal model for that to get us down the left-hand side of the V so that we can elaborate on intent of a system, which then becomes commitments of a system as you move down the left, so that we can specify the elements for fabrication and construction. So there's an intimation here then. If this requirement is going to exist in a systems model, then it must have an interface with, with that systems model. Just dropping it in there just means it's a storage place. But if we're truly going to integrate the requirement with the systems model, we need to have an architecture of the requirement and know how it interfaces with the systems model. And so for that, Shindell provided some additional thinking that we found quite helpful. And that is those requirements, we should be thinking about those as transfer functions. So what do I mean by transfer function? Well, here if we have a case of system one and system two, we're gonna think about writing a requirement for system two. We're probably gonna be specifying how system two is expected to behave to change the state of something else in that system. And the notion of a transfer function comes into play in that it, it just doesn't do that on its own volition. It really requires some stimulus, right? And that's why we have the notion of things like triggers in SysML. So there's the idea of a requirement being a transfer function that says, I will produce this output when I see this input. And those requirement functions are gonna therefore refer to elements of the systems model as I'm showing here on this drawing. They could also refer to an attribute. I kind of put that build in there last. So it could be a change uh, when this system gets an input X, it changes its state. And so these requirements can be really quite elaborate if they're fully written, fully explicated. Uh, they could be as simple as a function. If I get this input, I'm gonna produce this output. It could be a collection of functions that might vary based on time, or last, it might be complex logic, if then this type of behaviors. And so what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna drive towards the architecture of that requirement statement, and I'm gonna use this example to do that. And so what we're looking at is kind of an off-the-shelf packaging machine uh, where cartons are being pulled out of a sleeve in the upper left-hand side. And this is obviously running at slow motion. When this is going full speed, it's, it's like a propeller on an airplane. It's moving so fast. And so the physics is very important to us. Every single step in this is very important. And one example here is uh, the behavior of this cartoning machine to retain these cartons as they're pulled from the sleeve. Um, if, if they don't maintain the proper amount of friction on those cartons, uh, it might result in a failure to pick, which would stop the line, or it could be a waterfall behavior where more than one falls out and then you have to stop the line. And downtime is money in essence. So the idea is this, we're gonna talk about this carton escapement top device here, which, perform, which is a role basically in this system of systems here. In fact, every score, every bend point in that box is really a system. So let's look at that. So here's the uh, kind of a work point analysis diagram on the bottom right of this drawing. And let's, let's look at this in the context of the systems model. So here's, here's the role, the carton holder at the top, and then the requirement is gonna specify the behavior of that role. And so after many iterations on trying to embed requirements in the systems model, we ended up with a standard syntax, and I'll kind of unveil it here with a specific example. So here, in this example, we're saying that when this system is subject to a carton flow force, so the weight of those cartons that are stacked up, greater than five Newton meters, the carton escapement top, which is the role, the subject system of this requirement, shall provide a dynamic friction force in accordance with, and I'm kind of unveiling another part of this requirement for those of you that know 
constraint blocks, you can have constraint objects underneath them, and then essentially that's what we're using for to capture requirements. We're not using the requirement objects, we're using constraint objects. And so you can see that we fully built out kind of a transfer function for this role, this cart and escapement holder. When it gets a particular input force, it exerts a particular dynamic force in compliance with a constraint, which really is an equation. So if you take a step back at this, you can start to see really a pattern. There's some literal text that says when subject to that doesn't need to change. And then there's this flow or condition that the system sees. Then there's a declarative that just say, identifies the system and the behavior. It's either going to output a flow or it's going to change its state in compliance with a constraint. As we work through the use of that, we saw that there are some variations to this, that you could have multiple input conditions, you could have multiple constraints in a single uh, input condition, or you could have multiple in input conditions and constraints. But nonetheless, the pattern is still there, and we saw this to be true for any kind of requirement. It could be a macro level requirement that pertains to the su product supply system as a whole, or it could be uh, the behavior of a chemical or a device or a machine, it always worked. Or a work process step with humans, it always seemed to work. And in fact, we stumbled across some confirmation that this would work when we found a paper uh, that was written by Ron Carson of the Boeing Company in 2015 of an I and COSI conference, where he identified really different purposes uh, for requirement statement. So not necessarily different purposes, but then went on to identify the different elements of an architecture statement and then offered some standard syntax for those. It's our position when we analyze that paper, which is the only paper we've seen of its kind, when we put that against our thinking, we found that really they're consistent. It's just that we're calling out particular purposes in each one of these statements. So different purposes, but it's the, still the same underlying construct. And so in essence, we're confident that this very low level foundation, whether it's a performance, a stakeholder need, a safety issue, environmental, doesn't matter what it is, that it'll work. And we think that's important because in addition to just eliminating errors that are caused by not having requirements in context, and by the way, I think I, I went over it a little bit too quickly. I'm going to backtrack for a second here. Remember I was talking about the interface of a requirement with a systems model. So just like you would think about an interface between a pneumatic device uh, and the actuator, uh, we're talking about an interface between the requirement and the systems model. And so these parts of the sentence construct, you know, the word system, or these action words, or the adjective, or the constraint, these are all elements of the systems model. And so here we think we've defined the interface for it. And because this statement works in such a consistent way, it'll work all the way up and down the left-hand side of the V model too. So the interface works with elements of the systems model. And we know systems models work at any level of abstraction. So let me um, pick up the pace here a little bit. I see I'm running low on time here. So you know, why do we care about this? Well, there's other uses for standardized structured requirement statements. So if we think about the testing of requirements, many of us want to do these tests virtually via simulations and recoding requirements into simulations is probably not the best of work processes because those requirements are going to be fluid and they're going to change. And so imagine if you had a standard requirement structure, you could pass it to the simulation tool and it would know how to decompose that requirement. In fact, then you could have a requirements verdict manager that monitored the simulations for completion. Some might take minutes, some might take days. A systems model could, span, could specify that entire time window and then report back to the systems model which requirements had been verified. 
So to do this, we need semantic alignment. Therefore, we need a requirements editor that enforces the standard syntax. One last thought on this before we get into really the demonstration of how the uh, reuse companies tools support this is that the passing of these requirements to other systems is not limited to simulation. In fact, if you think about it, manufacturing monitoring systems where you instrument equipment that manufactures equipment or maybe secondly, operations, you might instrument a car uh, to produce alarms. Those are invariably behavioral requirements of the system. And so the idea here is that we shouldn't be rekeying those in factory floor manufacturing system or the operations elements of systems or even the analytics, the study of them over periods of time. They really should be passed automatically from the systems engineering model and we should pick up discrepancies between those. So that's the notion. They're, they're really, the requirements editor, in fact, might pull some of its syntax from these other systems one day. In other words, an action that might be governed by the simulation system or the operation system, so you can pick from a, a predefined set of vocabulary to drive consistency. So the demo is essentially going to show you how we construct the requirement in the Rhapsody systems modeling tool. Quick orientation on that. Here's the systems model. There's a role. You're going to see it as a yellow box. An attribute is a yellow box within a yellow box. The flow is a dashed red line. The requirement statement, a red box. The bindings from that requirement to the port that receives the flow. And then the bindings that refer to attributes. So let's go on to the demo. You'll watch us clicking on a requirement that just has been dropped into a system model, but it has not been populated. We just know that it's going to govern a flow and an attribute. And so we right click on that. The reuse company's authoring tool pops up. And as we start typing, reuse tool is reading the systems model and controlling what we enter. So there's no chance of mistake. And it's building hyperlinks into this statement so that when we accept the statement, and it gets written to the systems model. If the systems elements change, then those elements of the requirement statement change. Alternatively, if you rewrite it in the requirement statement, it changes those statements. So we'll look at the creation of a requirement now. So there's nothing on that drawing. Before, we were just elaborating, elaborating on a requirement that had been created. So we're going to right click on a system and we're going to, it's again reading that system. It knows what inputs and outputs it has, what attributes. We're going to complete the authoring of this requirement. And when we accept the statement, it will place the requirement on the drawing and it will also create the connections, the bindings between the, that requirement and the elements of the system upon which it depends. So you can see the binding lines here. So this is an idea of seamlessly integrating the authoring of a requirement. In other words, managing the interface between requirements and the systems model. So what else can you do with this? Well, so this is a hypothesis that we're in the process of proving. Haven't proved it yet. But it, we think that if there is a canonical model on the left-hand side, if, if there's this fractal, requirements can exist at any level, and the systems model looks the same at any level, why not have a canonical requirement specification? And in fact, we think this systems model works for weapon systems. In fact, we have experience where it has. Uh, Shindell has done consulting for any kind of industry that you can imagine. But we believe that if this canonical model will work in any industry, then the requirements integration will also. And so what would that look like, a standard requirement specification? Well, you know you'd have systems in it, and each of those systems has features that, that define its goodness. Those features are delivered by interactions that are carried out by sub-elements of that system, and there are levels of goodness of those sub-elements too, in addition to the attributes that sort of define their states, uh, and or their outputs. And so the idea is that we should be able to leverage an interface to this systems model to dynamically produce that requirements document. And indeed, 
we did work with the reuse company to do this in the form of a prototype. And now I'll give you a quick demo of what that looks like. So we're in Rhapsody again. We're invoking the requirements document generation interface. It went in, read the systems model, created the formal module, and it placed all the requirements in there, and they're kind of laid out here hierarchically, as I had shown you on that PowerPoint slide. We're going to edit one of those requirements. Let's change the condition. And then we're also going to create a requirement for a flow. So we'll right click, insert a new object. So we're working in doors, by the way, IBM doors, to do this requirement authoring. We're invoking uh, the reuse company's editor again from both places here, from doors, before, from Rhapsody. We're authoring the requirement. It's enforcing the same syntax. Then we're going to save this and then pull the requirements back into the model. There the requirement comes into the hierarchy and we have to drop it on the drawing because it obviously doesn't know what drawing we're looking at. So here's the notion really of trying to support a standard interface spec. And early on in this presentation, I called out the need for requirements documents to be disposable views so that we can maintain requirements and context all the time uh, and just have those document views to the extent that we need them. And so this, uh, I think I'm pretty short on time here. I think I'll wrap it up here so that we can get for, uh, to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. If you have any comments or questions, you can send them through the chat box to the reuse company. Oh, could I make one last appeal? I meant to. Yeah. So on this development journey, P&G is looking for partners uh, to go down this road for, for many reasons. The obvious one is that we also like to defer, distribute our costs. If other people need the same thing, it's why we buy commercial products. But I think for other reasons, too, we really do want to learn from other businesses who see similar problems, and we think we can because we're using these aerospace automotive tools now, and they're working beautifully for us. And I think, I think also that really there's a, a partnership opportunity here so that the tools, we drive standard tools, too, so that neither one of us have to reinvent this every time there's a change in the version that we really want to bake these into commercial tools and we can only do this through partnering. And so we've formed a consortium um, of automotive heavy equipment company and air, uh, air liner products company. Uh, right now we've been meeting for a year and we're going down the road of flushing out the requirements for these type of systems. Uh, if there are other people that, that have similar interests and think they might want to participate in that, uh, they should reach out to me, and my contact information is in the PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I will give you a couple of minutes to write down your questions, and meanwhile, I will tell you about our next webinar. It's called uh, Applying Machine Learning Techniques to the Flexible Assessment of Requirements Quality. To obtain quality measurements of requirements, it is common to use quantitative quality metrics based on established standards. However, the risk is to build assessment methods and tools that are both arbitrary and rigid in the parameterization and combination of metrics. This webinar is focused on the presentation of a flexible method to assess and improve the quality of requirements that can be easily adopted to different contexts, projects, organizations, and quality standards with a high degree of automation. The date for this webinar will be the second half of uh, September. No questions yet? We will give you some more Can I ask a question of people? Just uh, if there isn't any questions, I'm curious, do, do, does this resonate with people? Maybe you could just answer in with yes. Do you have common problems? Are you asking the participants? Yes. Yeah, yeah. they are muted. Uh, maybe you can, they can write to us, to the yeah. news company. Yes, yeah, somebody is writing. Uh, mm, let's see. Yes, the same problems, but currently looking at a new solution, maybe including doors next generation. Mm -hmm. And even then, you'll still need it in context, though. Uh, 
at least that's the hypothesis we're calling out here is that you still need to have those requirements elements. So just underlying technology might be different, but maybe the same use case. I'd be curious to see if you agree with that. I also see how do we approach, approach burning the boat? Yeah, uh, so we thought about it because we have a, a large, we have 30 plus disciplines that it, that it requires to take an initiative from concept to distribution around the world. And they all have huge work process frameworks and many documents, hundreds of document types. And we had a hard time figuring out how to interface uh, with those documents and still keep things structured. And so we're in the process of doing this transformation. So it's not completed, but what we've done is pick some initiatives and that are just beginning and we're managing their documentation from the concept stage all the way forward and producing the artifacts as we need it versus trying to jump in in the middle of an initiative with many moving parts and existing static word type documents. Uh, yes, I see the cultural change. That's right, yeah. So I would ask if there's any other consortiums that people know about that are working these types of problems. And I know about the uh, INCOSI requirements. I participate in them, but they're not really quite to this point. They're more working on, uh, I think, closer to the Boeing standard, uh, the actual words that are used in there versus the architecture of a statement. It's still document-based for the most part. Are there any requirements consortiums that you guys know of that you would put me in touch with? Mm -hmm. no, no comments? In a way, we have uh, uh, your email is, uh, uh, you yeah. can find it on the slides, right? I saw it on, on all the slides. So yeah. it's uh, easy to get in, in contact with you. Very good. Okay, so let's finish here. Thank you very much, Bob, for t telling us your experience. And thank you to all the participants. If you have any further questions or want to have more information, don't hesitate to contact us by email to contact at reusecompany.com or through our website, reusecompany.com. Thank you very much for your attention and see you on our next webinars. Goodbye. Thank you, guys. Bye.